Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. What I wanted as an artist was to shift things, disrupt maybe. Cool. Not just for the sake of disrupting, but to move things. Welcome listeners to another episode of In the Envelope. Did you miss me? A uh, reminder that we are airing every other week instead of every week going forward. However, with award season, am I allowed to say already underway? Are we underway with award season? I think it is if I say it is. Film and Guild award season is here and contenders like Ruth Nega, whose voice you just heard, are in the thick of things. And I guess you could say it's one of my most wonderful times of the year. And we have a lot of exciting guests coming up And even though we have switched to every other week, there will likely come weeks when we just have too many options and have to air weekly or more. Um, I'm excited about 2022, you guys. I'm so excited uh, about this interview with with Ruth Nega. I was obsessed with her before this, but I am, just to really break it down, I am obsessed with Ruth. Not just because of the on-screen performances. I've also seen her on stage. She's she's clearly a terrific, charismatic, compelling actor. But this is why we do this podcast, is because when you hear the artistic process and the artistic philosophy of artists like Ruth Nega, it adds so much to what's already there. It intellectualizes, but I think a big theme of this interview is it also, it speaks to something deeper and more inarticulable, if that's a word. I feel like a fun theme that's occurred on this podcast before actually is this idea that some of the things that we talk about about acting are really hard to talk about, but in trying to talk around them, you really get at a truth, a truth that I think maybe a lot of early career artists can understand on a more cellular, maybe more subconscious, less literal level. Ruth plays Claire in this new film, Passing, which is available on Netflix now. It's based on the 1929 novella from Nella Larson, and its title, just to give you some context, refers to the phenomenon of Black people, and in this case, Black women in 1920s New York City, passing as white. This is, of course, a, I would say, radical, subversive act, as Ruth discusses in great detail here, but it's also quite complicated um, in the novella and in uh, the film, which is from writer-director Rebecca Hall, best known as an actor, but Rebecca Hall here does an amazing job directing the story, starring Ruth and Tessa Thompson. And it navigates all kinds of issues around identity, like femininity, homosexuality, repression, repression, repression. And frankly, that is the type of stuff I love to talk about. That is the type of stuff that makes for fascinating insights into the process of someone who's building a character in that world and whose decisions made on camera really dictate that world. I can't say enough about Ruth's performance in this movie. I mean, there are so many shots of her that just take your breath away. And of course, it's set in the 20s, and there's something about Ruth Nega and her looks that just fit into the 20s. And I have to shout out Ruth's next project. Well, her next project is her making her Broadway debut opposite Daniel Craig in Macbeth. But then she is playing Josephine Baker, which if you know anything about what Josephine Baker looks like and what Ruth Nega looks like, that is a match made in heaven. So without further ado, let's get to this interview. Ruth, thank you so much for joining us, and keep breaking legs. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it... 
go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices and start applying to jobs because who knows, maybe one day I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope. Ruth Nega has had a clear artistic mission statement since her early days as an actor, breaking out in the films Capital Letters, Isolation, and Breakfast on Pluto. On TV, she starred in Personal Affairs, Shirley, and AMC's Preacher, and earned an Academy Award nomination as Mildred Loving in Loving. She now plays Claire in Rebecca Hall's already award-winning adaptation of Passing, and will next star on Broadway in Macbeth. Here is the brilliant Ruth Nega. Hi, Ruth. Hi. Hi, team. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. What are you up to today? Lots of press. Yeah? Yeah. For passing or this, yeah. none of this is connected to um, Macbeth? No, 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 not yet. No. But, but you, were you just rehearsing? Yeah. How do you know that? I know things. I mean, I... You know things. I moved from New York to LA, but I'm still very much connected to kind of the New York, like, theater Scene. community. Yeah. Did you, why did you move for the weather? Um, kind of, yeah. Um, well, congratulations on passing. I cannot wait to ask you all about it. I'm, it's, there's oh, so much nice. to get into. Yeah. Um, but first of all, we are backstage. We are the Actors Trade Publication. We are all about the craft and career advice. Right. Um, can I ask the big question? Why acting? Were you bit by the bug? What was the beginning of all of this? That's a very hard question to answer. I just always wanted to be an actor. No, tell a lie. So I asked my mom the other day, I said, um, mom, did I always want to be an actor? And she said, no, I wanted to be a doctor, like oh, my okay. father, until I was about seven or eight. And then I just decided to be an actor. <laughs> and the only, I don't remember the decision. I just don't remember wanting to do anything else. And. Being fairly certain it was acting I wanted to do before I even knew really what it was. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So um, at the risk of sounding like cheesy. It's, you love cheesy. It's vocational for me. Sometimes I feel like to interrogate that too much is to destroy a certain <laughs> magnificent magical. <laughs> Let's do it. I agree. Uh, do you know what yeah. I mean? And I, I know that sounds like, oh, I just don't want to answer the question. <laughs> um, but yeah, actually, absolutely. in this case, I do say that a lot. But in this case, I do, I do mean that. Yeah. I think it's just... Do you know, I only ever thought about it because uh, my cousin actually said to me once, she's, it's amazing, it's so amazing that you're so lucky because you've always known what you wanted to do. And, and I'd never thought about it in those kind of terms before. Mm. But, you know, I guess I am, like... Um, it was just, and you know, like I didn't really go to Saturday school things or anything because I just thought, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Hmm. It was a really like precocious, naive, I think, um, hmm. I wouldn't call it arrogance, but I well, just thought. Yeah, I, I think want, naive is, you know, is I key. want to do it. And so mm -hmm. I guess I'll do it. You know, it never occurred to me that, you know thousands of people you know train and don't end up getting work and you know it's heartbreak for so many people and you know it's absolutely. okay to need heartbreak even when you do get the work do you know what you mean so absolutely um that's so spot yeah, on there wasn't an epiphany right and like you're saying like there are two almost two different questions there of like one is how did you know you wanted to act to do the craft of acting and the other is as you say vocational or you didn't, you didn't necessarily know from the beginning what the career of an actor entailed. And that's no. where the naive was maybe a benefit. <laughs> Absolutely. There is sometimes blessing, blessings that come with ignorance. Yeah. Occasionally. Um, no, but I knew, see, my, I think my way in was through 
performers like Bowie and mm. Kate Bush and Prince, very physical performers who oh. sort of subverted the idea of a fixed identity um, or sexuality yes. or anything really. Um, and I really enjoyed exploring the idea of shape shifting and not being able to be pinned down, you know. Yeah. I just thought that was extraordinary. And to investigate the parts of you that are sort of more flamboyant, you know, because I think if you're quite shy and have social anxiety like me, that that's sort of something that is can be denied you, or you can deny yourself that. Um, but, you know, when you're performing or you're on stage, mm. it's, it's liberating, isn't it? Yeah, you've said you're most at home on stage, and that speaks to the off stage or off camera, you have the social anxiety, but in character, is it safe to say in character, that's when you can kind of express yourself or just be freer? You have your social anxiety and your insecurities, like all of us. Yeah. And so is acting therapeutic? It's cathartic? Yeah, I definitely think it is. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people go to great pains to say it's not. Mm. And that's fair enough. But for me, I mean, yeah, I can't see how it isn't. Do you know what I mean? It's a acting isn't just a job for me. It's a I don't know. It's a soul vocation. You know, it's something that I think is is helping me sort of understand myself, and my place yeah. in the world, and others, and my relationship to other people, and yeah. You know, and and why we're here. It's the the big why, you know. I think I've always been interested in that. You know, and I think, you know, I had a parent die quite young. And I think when you're, when death is in your life at quite a young age, I think all these questions become more, um, they're very prescient and they're more immediate. Yes. You know yes. what I mean? And so yes. you sort of, these kind of, the whys and wherefores are sort of thrust upon you, you know, whether you want it or not. Um, and so it's a curiosity, really, a curiosity to, I mean, I don't know. And you know what? I know I might never find the answer, but I think, you know, I realized long ago being an actor that I knew, I knew, the journey is much more fulfilling than the destination. I and mean, it always is. Mm. Definitely for acting, you know. But it's good to have an aim, you know. It's good to have yes. somewhere to aim for. But it's yeah. it's really necessary to understand it's not the getting there. No, it's not the there. It's the getting. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Oh, um, absolutely. So that's what I, you know, and, and for someone who's like, likes control, <laughs> I feel like something about my life, this life, is about surrender for me. It's learning to surrender. Great. Yes. And there's great freedom and liberation in that, even though it feels counterintuitive to me. <laughs> yeah, it is. A, yeah. I love this idea of a soul vocation. It's so much deeper than a, a gig. Um, and you mentioned physicality, and of course I had to ask you about that. Like, um, I love that the rock stars are, must have been early influences and in their physicality and your ability to express yourself in that way. Talk to me about process. Where does physicality fit in to your approach to a character? Are there things that you do for every role, every time? Mm, every role is different, you know, and at this stage, a lot of it is unconscious. You sure. know, because I've been doing, you know, I went to, I went to train at the Samuel Beckett Center in Trinity College Dublin when I was 18. So that's mm -hmm. 22 years ago now. Do you know what I mean? So, and that's, that through those three years were essential in terms of connecting me with my body and understanding that the cerebral and the intellectual are important, but they mm -hmm. are sort of, can become extraordinary, um, ways of investigating the human psyche when you when you bring the body into it you know gotcha. when you bring your gut instincts and the visceral nature of your body into it you know i feel like there's something i love going to see dance dance pieces 
Mm. Because there's something beautiful about sort of bypassing, short circuiting the brain and going yeah. straight to the belly, you know, and what that does and what that releases. And I just, I know that I need all my senses to communicate. That's just how I am. And so it's always been just a full body endeavor for me, you know, creation. Yeah. Um, and, and I couldn't, even if I wanted to, sort of dissect that. No, I suppose you can't be just brain or just body. There's a combination always. Well, actually, no, but I think, I think sometimes you can't be, but a lot of people do sort of think that you can. I'm amazed by how many people in the world are sort of are, have a severance going on between their, ah. their like, you know, we call them talking heads. Do you know ah, what I mean? Sure. But there's, there's a disconnect. And when mm. there's a disconnect from your body, I mean, I don't know how fully one is living then. Right. If you're you not connected to your breath, for example. Yeah, all those things and just yeah. being aware of your body and how we use it to communicate and how we use it to tell the truth and how we use it to lie. Okay. Um, mm. And the masks that we pick up and put down hourly, daily, you know, um, in order to survive in the world and, and the tension between that impulse and who we are at our core, you know, and how that yes. sort of... Um, I suppose, how you can integrate that. Yeah, that's um, answering the character building question really, really beautifully, because I, I feel like the physicality question is, how much are you thinking about truly inhabiting inside out versus don't you also have to consider how you are seen and how others see you and, and see your body? Very, very true. And that's really interesting because I was just talking on a previous um platform about um it was in a discussion about being black and irish mm -hmm. and um we talked about du bois wdb -E du bois and this idea of he um coined the term double consciousness and it's usually mm -hmm. in relation to um i suppose um minorities yeah. who um and in this case, people of color, black people and brown people who have to have sort of an extra awareness, an extra eye, an extra visual yeah. on how they are perceived in social settings to be safe. Yeah. That's what racism does, is that you have to also, while you're viewing your life through your own eyes, the privilege of it just being through your own eyes is taken away. And so you, because you mm. have to for your safety and security and um, often your sanity, mm. you view it through the prism of the people who are actually could endanger all of those things. Wow. Yeah. And in many ways that serves performers because that's what you're doing. Totally. Totally. Um, and so I understand that explains a lot to my own self about why people who feel like outsiders and misfits and people who, um, yeah, feel like the underdog are often really well suited to performance and totally. being an artist through any kind of medium. Do you know what I mean? Because they understand perspective yeah. and have to shift perspective. And that in turn is key to being an artist because it's at our essence, what we are is we're compassion and empathy machines. Hmm. You know, that's what our job is. Yeah. To be conduits. Um, in order, I suppose, to build a world where we're all connecting and connected. Yeah. And that sixth, that sixth sense helps facilitate that i suppose it can give you like a leg up in that yeah definitely knowing how you come up on camera and of course you've spoken too about the idea that like black irish people in entertainment you did not see a lot of yourself represented in the entertainment you were watching growing up 
And I assume that kind of factors into the evolving mentality around a career as an entertainer, around acting. Do you think of yourself as blazing trails for no other such minorities? No. No, I don't really. I don't really think of it in that sense. I don't. No, I don't because what use would that be? <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? I just don't know if it's useful to sit down and have a cup of tea and think, oh, I'm a trailblazer. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, that's not really for me to decide either, is it? Hmm. Really, isn't that... I suppose that's one's legacy that other people choose. But And I really don't hmm. know how comfortable I feel with choosing other people choosing my legacy for me. Right. Um, but the, the key is not to actually apply more control. I think it is, I'm learning in this lifetime to surrender. That surrender. Um, but no, yeah. I don't think of myself in those terms. I think in terms of choosing projects and projects where mm -hmm. I think my talents would be best put to use. And I feel that I can translate a human being's experience. That's the guiding force. Be a conduit. Um, and, 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 you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to combine my love of history with a lot of the parts I choose, you know. Mm. Um, and they are like, I suppose, I don't know, I've been very lucky with, with what I've had access to, mm -hmm. especially recently. I feel like what I wanted as an artist... Mm -hmm. um, was to sort of shift things, disrupt maybe. Cool. Not just for the sake of disrupting, but to move things, hopefully forward in some sort of way. And, and I think that's what artists really, what they're about. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, otherwise, there's no point. Um, and so, sure. you know, it's it's not just this frivolous thing of playing dress up which actually is not that frivolous I mean it's in play is an incredibly important part of childhood mm. um any psychologist worth their salt would tell you that but um and I feel like somehow I've occasionally made that align mm. you know with my part like playing Mildred Loving was such a a privilege for me because those kind of parts and giving voice to extraordinary women like her who mm. voices maybe have been put on mute Definitely. Um, has always been very important for me. Um, playing Hamlet was extraordinary for me personally because, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't even think, consider playing him because it just mm. didn't seem like, it didn't occur to me. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible thing. It just didn't occur to me. <laughs> And yet, who better in many ways to play Hamlet than the ultimate outsider, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, when I think when outsiders play Hamlet, you really, you don't see a whiny kind of privileged yeah. um, dude. You see someone who really is searching for truth mm. and, 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 and is angry at all this dissembling and this sort of, masking and and mm. and privilege for mm, privilege's sake and 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 mm. self-satisfiedness that comes with sort of privilege you know and access to privilege and and you know i think those things are really important you know um and it's still important and and you know and with passing i mm. think that pattern is it's a continuation of that pattern for me because it's about giving life and texture and complexity to women of color at a time when, I mean, we were hardly seen, let alone afforded um, any sort of narrative complexity. Right. Um, you know, literally on the edges of a frame, if that, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So this is, that's an, ex that's what makes the journey sort of, for me, really a privileged one and an, ex an exciting one because yeah, that's really what I wanted. I yeah, 
all of those roles really fit into like the artistic mission statement, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that, yeah. What is your advice for all actors, but especially those at the beginning of their career, for that idea of how to how to carve the path, how to say how to say yes to which roles and no to others? I have no idea. <laughs> Listen, I'm loath to give advice. Sure. And we also, it's been said on this podcast, you can't emulate somebody's career path, especially in the arts. So no, you can't. Copy really. what you, you do. Can't. It's so personal. It's so deeply personal. Yeah. But I think you can be inspired mm-hmm. um, by people. Um, but advice is tricky because what what works for one person isn't necessarily what works for another person. Totally. You know, timing is different. Access is different. I don't know. Um, I would say... I don't know, you know, I think, listen, just mm. listen to your needs and yourself. And yeah. I don't know, I think if if you can go to a quiet place inside yourself and listen to your inner spirit or whatever you want to call it, do you know mm. what I mean? I think, I think that's the best thing you can do that's and great. listen and stay curious mm. because I think the best ammunition or armor against the uncertainty that can crop up in this job, the unfairness that can crop up in this job, um, <laughs> is to stay curious and to stay listening. Hmm. And, 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 I, and I don't know what that means to others individually, but Absolutely. You can, I think that's up to you to explore and define for yourself. Yeah. No, that was beautiful advice. Um, by the way, I just have to I just have to throw this out there. I meant to say this. I saw your Ophelia in 2010. No way. Yes. And so and then I didn't see this Hamlet, which I would have just loved to kind of see those and compare you on either side of that story. Mm. It must have been wild to I mean, I guess everybody does multiple Hamlets or whatever. But what do you remember about Ophelia? <laughs> yeah. Um my God. I mean, I will say that Aoife Duffin, who played Ophelia in our Hamlet, was far better, superior than I was. Oh, interesting. Um, sure, sure, I, sure. She was extraordinary. I mean, really, I I felt, I mean, it's a, a notoriously difficult part because yes. I hate to say it, but it is sort of underwritten. And so you have yes, to yes. bring the absences with you onto stage and sort of mm-hmm. fill them somehow. Ooh, cool. And that's tricky to do. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I don't know if I did that. <laughs> you know? Well, we often talk on this podcast about backstory and inventing. And, you know, sometimes that involves research and sometimes it involves what little source material you have or you have lots. And maybe this is where I can ask you about passing. You had a lot of source material. You had a lot of access to this character's, can we say, interiority? Yes. So were you inventing? Did you have those spaces to fill with this role? Well, now I'm really worried about not having, um, <laughs> like, resources. Because on Loving, I we had um, Nancy Bursky's documentary, The Loving Story. Mm-hmm. Um, on this, we had the novel, novella, sorry, um, that Rebecca Hall adapted from. Um, and, you know, for Josephine, which we'll be shooting sometime in the next while. So you know. Exciting. I, there's inordinate amounts of source material. So <laughs> God help me if I have to do something with that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any source material. I mean, look, it's invaluable. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, you know, one of the, one of the um, joys of being an actor for me is, is research and reading and, you know, so that kind of satiates my curiosity and is invaluable. Um um, and so, you know, I do all that and everything. And, and a lot of the time is daydreaming. Ooh. Yeah, giving yourself, oneself, the time to daydream and meditate and let yourself be open to be being struck by something, you know. And is that sort of like in character meditating or more no. like thinking no, about the character? just maybe being on the bus and... yeah. I don't know, imagining, or someone will move their arm like in a certain way and you'll think, oh, I love that. 
That's clear. Um, do you know what yeah. I mean? So it's I all do. of those, you know, when, you're, when your work is your body and your body is your work, you, you mm-hmm. kind of are never off. Um, and everything is, what did Nora Ephron say? Everything is copy. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I think that works for, for actors too. Mm-hmm. Um, except, you know, and I, but also I think it's, sometimes it's important not to, I don't know if it is or not, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I always kind of have this like argument with myself about how much to share and how much not to, you know, how much does articulation your process sort of pedestrianize it? I've been thinking about this too, <laughs> you know? totally. And, um, and is that just me being snobbish, wanting it to <laughs> well. stay sort of mysterious and sort of just <laughs> out of reach, you know? Um, is that elitist even? Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Um, mm. But I do think sometimes... W. B. Yeats said, I think he said it, and this is, this is, I'm going to butcher it, but I um, said something about, it's not the job, artist's job to translate, it's your job to understand. <laughs> Do you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. The viewers. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I sometimes think the whole reason artists make art and actors act is because words alone aren't enough. Yes. To bear witness to certain yes. experiences, the hu- certain human experiences. And so it's a full body, full spiritual experience. And I don't know if, you know, I think, I think trying to articulate that is sort of, for me, it's, it's capturing something. It's like trying to put lightning <laughs> in a bottle. Is that the phrase? Um, yeah. And I don't know if you can do that. Sure. Change the chemical nature of that lightning does it make it less interesting does it make it less does it deaden it does it make it less bright does it le- make it less effective i, I wonder about that too yeah i wonder yeah i do think though that, that that talking about the mysteriousness of it and trying to talk around the real meaning of the thing i don't know it helps people understand or it helps people yes, speak to important. that humanity. And, you know that's the other thing and the other because 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 i do I, I i love reading books about you know, artists and how they work and and whatnot. And, you know, I think it's important to, you know, illuminate the yeah. the darkness. Do you know what I mean? But um, I always think of it like this. I think, would you like a gift that the giver didn't want to give you? Oh, interesting. No. So I feel mm. like sometimes if an artist feels like they don't want to discuss their work, I think... Fair enough. Like, I wouldn't want to receive something that someone wouldn't yeah. want to give me. Do you know what I mean? And, and to and your I point, it's the audience it. receiving that's the, the important part of art. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's, it doesn't happen without an audience. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So how does this work with you watching your own work? You've seen Passing? Yes, I have. It's beautiful. Yes. yes. So can I, I ask you think... to describe Claire, like, as an audience member? <laughs> Well, that's interesting, actually, because what I saw on screen actually was slightly unexpected. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't expecting the brittleness and the vulnerability to be as clear. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a couple of years ago now, but I think hopefully that was my intention. <laughs> You know, um, it's always hard talking about process, you know, years down the line because you sort of, I don't keep a diary, perhaps I should, but what would I write in it, you know? Mm. Um, I think that, like Claire, I think I sometimes, I'm not sure where the the performing started and where it ended. And I think for Claire, that was the same thing. Do you know what I mean? And that she's aware she's performing she's enjoying it but i don't think she's necessarily aware of how heartbreaking she is for others she sees herself as light you know her name is claire Hmm. um claire de la lune um and confident and magnetic and a butterfly and and yet that the sorrow and the hurt Hmm. are not is not never far away from that. And I think it's because it's getting to the point now in her life where mm. 
She can't keep a lid in it. She mm. can't. There's only so much you can keep secret, isn't there, in life before it yeah. sort of curdles you and you can yeah. feel it curdling you. And I think it's, she's like this pressure cooker. And um, I don't want to say the ending is inevitable. Mm. And I don't want to say it's a punishment because I don't believe those things. No. But that is what happens. The pressure cooker because boils over. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. She doesn't even have a chance to boil over. Ah. Society robs her of that chance. Gotcha. Yeah. Because yeah. it cannot tolerate someone like Claire mm -hmm. who has a keen spirit and will to live fully, mm -hmm. but on her own terms and society can't allow that because if, yeah. as it is, passing for white, she's destabilizing the status quo. Do you know what I mean? Totally. And that's just mm. unbearable, unsupportable for yeah. society at the time. Unsupportable. And yes, and so, of course, she's going to be punished. And mm. society and the ridiculous social mores that sort of were legislated upon with the Racial Integrity Act and mm. Plessy, Vergus, Fergus, Plessy versus Ferguson before that and then Brown versus um, the Board of Education and then, you know, um, Loving versus Virginia sort yes. of um, upending the miscegenation law. So do you <laughs> know what I mean? Like these were all legislated upon. People's yes. lives were legislated on because... What she's to prevent what she's doing. Absolutely. Because what she's doing is essentially dangerous and disruptive to, at that time, white supremacy. Yeah. Which was essentially what was happening in the law in America, it was being legalized. Um, and I think that's quite clear if you look at the history books. Um, and so that couldn't be tolerated. So, in a way, I think Nella is showing how. Light, beauty, energy, effervescence can be strangled, strangled and strangulated and destroyed mm. by this sort of really perverse idea of right and wrong and black and yeah. white and binary, which doesn't really exist. It's just a stick that the powerful few use to beat the rest of us with. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, That's absolutely. the nature of power, unfortunately. Yeah, still. Absolutely. Can I ask you also about the femininity aspect? I'm what you said about the gestures, the way that you study gestures and then incorporate that into your performance. What I really took away from Claire, I love this idea that like she doesn't we the edges are blurred of her performance itself. Like she's yes. always performing, of course. But is she weaponizing the feminine I don't know, the idea that in the 1920s and maybe still today, femininity is equated with weakness. And so this vulnerability that she's showing is secretly strength, but she knows that it's seen as vulnerable. Do you know what I mean? Was that gibberish? Well, no, not at all. Um, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, when, I think, when you look at one's arsenal as a human being in order to get on in life and achieve what you want to achieve, it's not everyone is equipped with the same sort of weaponry. And yeah, so... Yeah. You have to utilize what you have access to the best way you can. And for Claire, that is, she has decided, like many people, that the way to access power is to mm. exploit what she has. Mm -hmm. And that's using her femininity, her wiles, if you will. Um, yeah. And... I don't have any judgment on that, nor should I. No, nor I think, else, don't we all do that to some extent? We all absolutely, have that arsenal. Absolutely. Yeah. But some people are condemned more yeah. than others. Yes. And it's usually the same old people who are being um, discriminated against and yes. that society discards Yeah. and demonizes, actually. You know, and you have the legacy of the black female body being abused, not being, being owned, literally, yeah. 
by white men during slavery and then being seen as lascivious and um, enticing in a sort of yeah. dark and devilish way. Yeah. And so these, these are the legacies that yeah. racism has left with, left us with. And that's the option that Claire is, is left with, that she feels she's left with. Yeah. And, and she uses it to gain access to a life she wants. And you can't judge that if that's the only weapon in her arsenal. Do you know, you cannot begrudge a person that. Right. Um, but, I mean, and actually it's, in, it's entirely understandable and acceptable, um, but seen as taboo because of who's doing it. Yeah. Um, but I think in her ultra femininity, you know, I think she's sort of, she's reveling in the power that that can give her. Mm, okay. In the power that her magnetic presence can give her. And if like your she, access she, to power is supremely limited, hmm. what are you going to do? That's what the audience is invited to ask of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she is conscious of wielding this power of in, a, in a bid for power. Yeah. I mean... It's not an accident. No, and it's quite clear that that... She almost makes it look like it's contains an an inordinate amount of tension for her, yeah. um, internal tension. Do you know what I mean? And there's a, when she acknowledges that she will, she says, I will trample on anybody to get what I want. I don't think that's necessarily entirely true, but she is, hmm. in my mind, she's seeing the double consciousness thing that Du Bois is talking about. She's not seeing how other people might see her. And that's sad. Yeah. Because it's not necessarily a choice. And this is the thing about passing. People have called it a chosen exile, self-exile. Mm. And, and I think those, both of those terms are misnomers because I'm not sure how, how much of a choice it is when there's no other choices available. What choice do you have? Yeah. Do you know what you mean? Exactly. Um, when the choice between danger destitution and hmm. the risk of being found out could, you know, your life could be at stake. Yeah. So choice is sort of really not in it. Um, you're just seeing someone decide to survive. What she's suffering now is feeling completely disconnected from any of her previous life yeah, and feeling disconnected from her community, the black community. And mm. you can feel that it's taken its toll. Yeah. That's that tension. Yeah. Wonderful. It is such a fascinating role and, and story to think about. Cause I mean, I guess it sort of got me thinking about the idea that really interesting stories are watching people who have no choice. What do you do when you, when you have, when you don't have the benefit of a, a bunch of power and a bunch of choice. Ah, uh, yeah. People who are trapped in that rock between a hard place like you're talking about. Yeah. What then happens? Like, that's the, that's what makes a riveting story or a riveting Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think we are generous enough with hmm. allowing ourselves to have compassion for people yeah. in that position. I think I think we are incredibly judgmental and I think for me art in any of medium is is sort of trying to bypass judgment yeah and encourage compassion and empathy yeah that's really beautifully said um it's been said on this podcast before like as an actor you shouldn't judge your characters and I almost feel like your point is even bigger like don't be judgmental at all it goes back to this idea of gut, not brain, bypass the brain, and just take art on a subliminal level to see how it affects you or makes you feel. 
and not trying to analyze and name and intellectualize and Well, I do understand the need for that because, you know, it's great that people are curious and they want to interrogate things. And I think I absolutely don't think we should divorce um, our intellectual from our visceral. I don't think. I think I think it's about integrating them both. Exactly. And placing them at a at a at a a a place of equal value. Do you know what I mean? Um, Because. But I do think there's something to be said for not always having to interrogate um, or articulate, I mean, yeah, with language, something that is bodily or something that is instinctive yeah. um, or unconscious, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we, we spend enough time, you know, giving our unconscious sort of credit for the work it does oh, in... Cool digesting, you know, um, day, daylight ideas, ideas that we discover in the daylight, you know. But I think a lot of, I think a lot of artists are loath to translate because mm-hmm. that makes it very one-sided. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, totally. It's in, like you said, there is, it happens, art it really happens in the space between the art and the person receiving it. Okay. And that's a unique experience between those two. It's a very intimate thing. And for me to try and translate that into something uni- universal mm. um, without thinking about the individual nature of it is tricky. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I really admire the attempts, but I sometimes feel like I can't. <laughs> it's not. I hear that. Not my, it's not always mine to explain either. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Well, and it's that thing where when you try to make something universal by putting a name on it, it may, actually makes it very narrow and it boxes Yes, in. yes. Yeah. And I think sometimes we... It's really interesting, isn't it? Because it seems counter, but we, are, we can really only understand the universal if we, if we make it um, parochial. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? If we make it micro, the macro can sort of, we are only able to like, digest it yeah. if we make it micro. And that means like stories about an individual person or, do you know what I mean? Um, so I think if we attempt to do a universal thing, I think we just get lost in the miasma of the, <laughs> just the bigness of it. Um, totally, totally. So, um, that's all the good stuff. That's all the best stuff right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think well, listening, actors listening to this are going to get a lot out of this. Ruth, thank you so much. Well, I hope so. Totally. Like, it's that thing of, like, they're, maybe they don't understand it on a conscious, literal yeah. level. And but it a is cellular like, level, it's happening. Yes. You know what I mean? Immerse yourself in it. And like you said, yeah. like, sit there and meditate and have it come in through the silence. Just be open and curious. Yeah. yeah. It's excellent yeah. advice. Thank you so much. I have to ask uh, you, um, we have a couple silly, like, actorly nerdy questions. Great, go ahead. I shoot. haven't asked you about auditions. Do you have an audition horror story? Do you like auditions? Oh, I don't know. They're very nerve-wracking. But you know what? I always say to um, younger actors, um, remember, it's also useful for you to audition because yeah. you're also auditioning the director (laughs) for I know it might not seem like that because it seems the power is going one way but it's and it's not just um an exercise in making yourself feel better it's actually real I feel like do you want to work with this person Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean and that's very important too do you want do you have chemistry with the person and so sometimes when I think about that I think it's sort of it's a way to sort of reclaim your power in the moment but it's also a really serious consideration. Great. Um, but my God, they're tricky. And there's so much work that goes into like 20 minutes. I mean, you put so much work into 20 minutes, especially if you're self-taming at, at home. Like you've got to be a whiz, yeah. a light whiz, a camera whiz, all this. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of effort. Um, but yeah, and you know what? They're, they're also mini acting exercises. Sure. Have you been filming lots of self-tapes, like, recently in the pandemic era? No, I didn't do anything. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. I didn't do anything in the pandemic. I didn't do anything. Not a jot. <laughs> That's great. I read a lot, but um, and I daydreamed a lot. 
but no, mm-hmm. no. It was I. I had been working kind of nonstop for a good few years, and um, I'd done Passing and then Hamlet straight after in New York, and I was so very spent emotionally, physically, and I just yeah. needed to fill back up and um, with a bit of care and attention. Yes, a bit of life. Yeah. yeah. Well, not um, like really, because we're all stuck. But I think some yeah. soul attention. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. That Nourish. soul vocation idea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay. Last question. This is the tough one. What is one performance you think every actor should see and study? Oh my gosh. Okay. Richard E. Grant in Withnal and I. Uh, what a great answer. We just spoke to him a couple months ago. You didn't. Yes. Oh my God. He's a dream. That is an extraordinary performance. You know, he's teetotal, he doesn't even drink. He's like allergic to alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. That is uh, an extraordinary performance. It's so funny, affecting, and he's deadly serious in it. And I think it's the best Shakespeare on celluloid. I, with Nell? With Nell, yeah. Really? He does the speech at the end from Hamlet. Oh. Quint, the quintessence of dust. I mean, thinking about it now brings tears to my eyes. And it's beautiful because the, the thing that gets you, the really, the exquisite pain and sadness mm. is that he will never get to play the Dane and he's quite possibly the most perfect Dane there is. Yes. Oh, just he he um he came to see me in Hamlet, and um, oh. Oh. I I got my lines all wrong. <laughs> oh, no. I think I was so nervous. Oh, yeah. there was this just ridiculous line where it's not ridiculous line because it's Shakespeare, but I made it ridiculous <laughs> at the end where he says, "Um, the cat will mew and the dog will have its day," and I said, "The cat will meow." Oh, and no one could look at me on stage. Luckily, I, I, I hightailed it off stage because it was my exit. <laughs> I left everyone to silently weep from laughter. And he was in the audience, so that was not great. So, but there we go. And That's I didn't really... ask if he liked it or not. <laughs> oh, God. I didn't want to know. <laughs> That's a really, really good answer. I think any working actor that hasn't seen that movie should because it's about I, that. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, they're both exquisite in it. Um, mm-hmm. Him and Paul McGann, and it's it's the funniest and the saddest piece of writing and perf- performance um, yeah, I've seen, really. That's wonderful. That so provides such a great little window into your, your process and yourself. So thank you so much, Ruth. This is so great. <laughs> I've given too much away. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to put those walls back up. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, keep breaking legs. I, I'm I'm going to try to come see Macbeth somehow. Oh, some do. Way. I'd love that. Uh, yeah, do. Must be so fun. It is. I'm thrilled, actually. I'm thrilled. I'm really thrilled. It's lovely to be. It's lovely to be back working. I realize that, you mm-hmm. you know, um, it's very important to work from a place of nourishment, that you your body is nourished, you're, you, you've slept, you know, you're... It's just much more, it's just easier. And I think it's, um, you know, you have a duty of care to your body and your mind as an actor. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and I think too many of us realize that too late. <laughs> sure. So mind yourselves. That's great. Mind yourselves. All of yourselves. Mm. All bits of you. Wonderful. What a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. Pleasure speaking to you. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. 
Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.